subject I've been given to speak on, which is the whole question of crisis, rural crisis in Australia and the New World Order, is one that really needs two or three hours, but I, I promise to spare you that much tonight, and I hope to get you back before midnight. But something of the complexity of all this perhaps could be uh, understood if I told you of a meeting that I had down in Victoria about ten days ago when I was the guest speaker of a the annual convention of the Farm Management Society down in Albury. And the subject I'd been asked to speak on was the New World Order, which created a lot of controversy. Uh, there was some dissension about whether I should be there speaking. Apparently it's a hot subject. But the most interesting thing to me was that the conference concluded with the convener getting up and telling the audience his experiences. He said, um, I have heard Prime Minister Bob Hawke and President George Bush talking about a new world order. And I was interested in that and I wondered if it had any bearing on economic problems facing farmers. So he said, I rang the Department of Trade down in Canberra and said, look, have you any material on the new world order and could you provide a speaker to our forum? so that we can get a bit more information. To which there was a long pregnant pause, the other end of the telephone line. And they said, well, they did have some material on the New World Order, but they weren't quite sure if they were at liberty to release it, and they certainly didn't have any speakers. And um, there was a bit of shuffling around where they asked each other what the right thing to do was, and apparently nobody quite knew, so they suggested he get onto the Department of Foreign Affairs, which probably was the right department dealing with that subject. So he rang the Department of Foreign Affairs, and he said there was an even longer, more pregnant pause, the other side of the line, and they said, yes, they did have a lot of material on this, but they weren't quite sure how far they could go in releasing it, and beside that, they didn't have speakers, and they went quite sure if they could help, but why not try the Prime Minister's Department? So he rang the Prime Minister's Department and he said the pause there was the longest of the lot and they said they had a, a lot of material on the New World Order program but they didn't have any speakers and the material they had, as far as they understood, could not be released without the personal go-ahead of the Prime Minister who wasn't available at that particular time. So they were dreadfully sorry but they couldn't help. And he said that was the situation. We have coming over our news services a whole lot of talk about the New World Order and Australia's involvement in it, but apparently we can't get government speakers to come and tell us what it's all about, and that is the reason that I've been invited to speak. And I've got to be honest in saying that over the 20 odd years that I've been looking at this question, that's broadly been the reaction. A lot of people have a vague feeling there's something called a New World Order but uh, it's not one of the things you speak about in polite company and apparently we've reached the stage now where if you want to get on in this hard cruel world you're not allowed to speak about politics or religion or the new world order and if you keep off those three you're going to do very well about uh, ten days ago we had an article in the Australian by an academic called John Carroll speaking about the whole question of protection of Australian industry now he struck something of a blow by saying that unless we begin to do something to protect our Australian industries it's now only going to be a short time till we have nothing left to protect whatsoever. And he made the point that since the 1970s we have decimated half our industries in Australia. That's in a period of 21 years. Half our industries have gone. whole range of things that we used to produce we don't make any longer. We buy them and we wonder why everybody jumps up and down and complains about the foreign debt. Now I want to tell you why we've done that and how it fits in with the New World Order and what the New World Order is. I never really came across the New World Order as a subject until I was lecturing in New Zealand in the fairly early part of the 70s and I happened to be speaking in a little town called New Plymouth on the North Island. It's a beautiful little Really, it's a little fishing town that nestles under Mount Egmont, if you've ever been there, on the west coast. And I was speaking at that time on the growth of the debt of the third world countries and the fact that they'd already reached a stage 
they were trying to borrow money to pay the interest on what they'd borrowed previously and there's no possible way that anybody can survive doing those sort of things and at the end of the meeting a lady came to me and said look uh, I've got a little book that might interest you that um, seems to relate to what you're talking about and I said look I haven't got time to to read it but if I could borrow it I'd certainly be appreciative so she gave it to me and I didn't have a chance to look at it until I got on the plane coming back to Australia and I opened it up and it was a little book called A Common Interest in a Common Fund which meant nothing to me whatsoever so I began to read it and it was written by an Australian economist by the name of Dr. Helen O'Neill who was might have been Humpty Dumpty for all I knew but it was a story of a program that was unfolding through the United Nations for the transfer of control of all basic commodities out of nations like Australia to a division of the United Nations called UNCTAD, United Nations Conference on Trade and Development. And what was going to happen if this program was realized would be that 18 international commodity boards would be set up through this division of the United Nations which would take charge basically of the world's foodstuffs and fibers and minerals. Now that was pretty important to Australia. It listed the sort of things. Grain and meat and fibers like wool and cotton, timber, sugar, coffee, cocoa, obviously think not things we produce here but then it went on to a whole list of minerals like iron ore and coal and copper by the time you came to the end of the list of commodities they were considering you'd virtually touched all what we call primary industry here in Australia. Now once they had established central control through the United Nations of these commodities something called a common fund would be set up which is where the title came from which would be like a a kitty which all nations would contribute into and they would try and establish what is sometimes called supply management and reserve price schemes and they would arrange deals between producers and consumers and uh, all, all participating nations which basically meant every nation in the world because um, everybody with the exception of one or two were members of the United Nations would be compulsorily um, um, required to take part in this thing. I thought to myself, if this thing is really a goer, I would have seen about it in, say, The Land, which is the main rural paper in Queensland or in New South Wales or the Queensland Country Life or the Grain Growers or whatever it happens to be or perhaps some of the small business papers because um, they would be discussing this. I mean, every issue is coming out on marketing schemes and how we attract exports and if this was really on the drawing board, surely all their members would have been debating this thing hotly. I'd never seen a reference to it. So I thought to myself, it must be a dream that they've got coming up sometime in the future. But nevertheless, coming through this book, there was enough to suggest that a lot of preliminary discussions had already taken place to make me want to know more. And then also through the book came a thing called the New World Order. This commodity fund idea was part of the New World Order. So when I got off the plane in Sydney, instead of going home, I, I looked up the United Nations in the telephone book. And uh, yes, they had a number and I subsequently discovered they had one of the top real estate spots in Sydney in Martin Place. So I went along there and found quite an imposing building and a big staff, mainly from the third world. Obviously they weren't helping the Australian employment situation but nevertheless all very efficient and sitting behind computers and looking very industrious and busy and I said to the girl at the inquiry desk, look I've come across this little book and it seems interesting to me and I'd like to know how it fits into the United Nations and also what this thing called the New World Order is. Oh, she said, well that, we've got stacks of material on that. That is basically the ongoing agenda of the United Nations, all the international discussions and the great conferences and the sessions and the assemblies are concerned with this unfolding world order program. So I said, well, can you give me some stuff that I can take away that I can understand it? Well, no, we don't have it uh, available to take away, but we do have a reading room and you can go in there and 
we'll provide anything you want. So I said, well, would you bring me everything that I need to understand the full ramifications? Oh, she said, that's a fair bit of stuff. And I thought to myself, this is going to take two or three hours. And she came out with a trolley about twice the size of this table here beside me, loaded up with books and pamphlets and reports that came from anywhere you can think of. The International Monetary Fund and the World Bank and think tanks in America like the Brookings Institution and uh, conferences of UNCTAD and conferences of UNIDO and UNICEF and then uh, more think tanks in Europe. And by the time you've gone through all this, um, I didn't spend three hours there, I spent three days coming back every morning and sitting down and making copious notes and I didn't even know what I was really looking for. But gradually, as you went through all this stuff, out of it came quite a clear picture of a program that was already partially under discussion and being implemented, which was called the World Order Program. And it had a number of parts. The first part was a very big program called NEO, New International Economic Order, N-I-E-O, that contained a number of agreements, in in uh, ingredients, the first of which was that the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, both of which are divisions of the United Nations, would be merged into a world central bank with all the powers that our reserve bank does here in Australia, capable of controlling all lending and investment and exchange rates and transfer of funds from one part of the world to the other and stock exchanges and the whole bit. Now that was a pretty big concept, a new world central bank that would take charge of all the world's lending and investment. And then it was argued that to facilitate this program, the main reserve currency that nations trade in at the moment, which is the American dollar, established at the Bretton Woods Conference towards the end of the war, would be gradually phased out and a new world money system would come in, which would replace the American dollar as the money that nations trade in. And uh, there was a bit of a discussion about what it would be called. It would either be called Special Drawing Rights, or one suggestion was Bank Corp, which was a name dreamed up by the, the man who'd actually been involved in setting up the International Monetary Fund, John Maynard Keynes of the Keynesian Economic System. And he'd also thought up this idea of world commodity control. Irrespective of what it was to be called, here was a world central bank issuing a new world money system which would replace national currencies and it was a totally new ball game. And the third part was this thing I'd already seen. International control of all the world's foodstuffs, fibers and minerals and uh, supply management and the pricing mechanism and the whole bit. It was a huge program. Now that spun off into a number of specific pro um, programs. They had another thing called the Law of the Sea which was uh, international control of all seabeds and the exploitation of minerals on the seabed and fisheries and a narrowing of territorial waters and a whole range of things like that. So it was a huge program. And I could not understand why it was that we weren't seeing more discussion about this in uh, our rural papers and in business papers because obviously Australia was already at least partially committed to the whole idea. So I began to lecture on it. What I could understand of it and what I'd pieced together and documented, I lectured to farmers and business groups and anybody who was interested in hearing it saying, do you know that Australia is already partially involved in this and have we looked at the implications? And I found on the whole total inc incredulity. People found it very difficult to believe that such a thing was even possible. And farmers on the whole used to treat me with good humored contempt. I mean, you know, if what you're saying is true, was the reaction, we would have seen it. I mean, we're having conferences every other day on marketing and selling our stuff overseas. And, you know, we've got our own elected leaders running the farmers' federations. And, and they, you know, it was really sort of, um, you were trying to push. You couldn't even get people to look at the thing properly. And to show you how absurd it's got, the last time I was lecturing over in Western Australia, I was invited by one of their farming organizations, the Pastoralists and Graziers, to go and have a meeting with their executive, which I did in a very plush building in the middle of Perth, obviously spent with or built with the subscriptions of hundreds and hundreds of Pastoralists and Graziers. And there they had this, well, it looked very like a, an ivory tower to me, and we went up 
a few floors and we sat around a boardroom table and we had coffee and they said to me, you know, when you used to come around about 10 years ago lecturing on this new international economic order, there was always a bit of a flurry and people used to send us tapes in of what you'd said and we'd um, sort of scratch our heads and we'd get hold of the local member of parliament and say, you know, what's this new international economic order? And they'd write back saying, haven't a clue, probably something those nuts in the right wing are pushing around and we, we sort of forgot about the whole thing. We thought it was just absurd. But now that Australia has ratified the program, and this was in 1989, we're getting the first documents from the United Nations on marketing in the future and it's pretty pretty frightening stuff. What do you think we ought to do about it? Well, I didn't quite know at that stage. It's rather like saying, uh, how do you catch the horse after the stable door's been left open? So all I could think of was, well, look, I think the first thing you ought to do, surely, is on a bound, is to write to all your members, who after all pay your salaries, telling them what's going on and asking what their reaction is. And, so that at least they've got an up-to-date understanding of the whole program. And then to my amazement, when I sat drinking my coffee, they had an intense discussion amongst their own executive about whether they should do that or not. I don't know what the outcome was, but their paper has never carried a story on the whole thing yet. And here we are two years afterwards. So you'll still find that the executive understands the whole thing, but the ordinary grassroots membership is still going around saying, well, of course, it couldn't be true because, you know, our representatives would have told us by now. That's how absurd it gets. Now, it wasn't very long after that that I went back to New Zealand and was lecturing, strangely enough, in exactly the same town of New Plymouth. And that night, there was a trade union man present. And he worked in the meatworks in Howrah, just outside New Plymouth. And he came up at the end of my lecture. By this time I was speaking on the new international economic order and he gave me this little book. And he said, uh, we thought this was double Dutch, but apparently it is the program we're all to follow and all our trade union branches have been given a copy of this and we're supposed to, supposed to be studying it. And he said, uh, until you spoke this evening, we didn't, I didn't know what to make of it. Would you like to have a look? So I grabbed it. And again, I didn't look till I was on the plane coming back to Australia, opened it up, and there was a little book, not printed in New Zealand or Australia or London or anywhere like that, but printed by the Novosti Press Agency Publishing House in Moscow. <laughs> and the gentleman who wrote this little book was called Ernest Dubminsky, who was one of their top economists in the Kremlin. And there's a little blurb about him in his photo at the back. But apparently he's not working in Moscow. He is part of a team of 400 Soviet officials working for the United Nations, all on the permanent payroll. He was in Geneva. And this little book is the official Soviet evaluation of the New World Order program. And I thought, well, they won't like it very much. I mean, they went, even in the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank at that stage, they were rather hostile about the whole thing. So I opened it up and started re reading and it hit me like a sledgehammer because right in the opening preface he makes the point that the whole concept of a new world order was originally put on the world's agenda by the Soviet Union and it wasn't Mr. Gorbachev or Mr. Brezhnev or even Kosygin or Khrushchev it was Lenin back in the 1920s who developed the concept of a new world order and the book spells out the whole concept. Uh, if you can imagine a brilliant revolutionary putting together the most vicious revolution that seized power in the Soviet Union in 1917 and then devising a program, now not looking till the next election. <coughs> you see, if you become a dictator, you don't have to worry about the next election any longer. You look ahead perhaps 50, 60, 70 years and broadly he divided his future program into two parts. One was devoted to revolution, which was aimed basically at destabilizing the Western world, the great capitalist nations, the enemy. And that meant getting into every area you possibly could, into their colonies, doing something about breaking up their trade routes, endangering their raw materials and supplies, breaking up their markets, and then destabilizing their social structure, getting into their educational mechanisms and their universities, and even, believe it or not, into the churches. 
because if you can inject new ideas right through, you can confuse people and bewilder people and you can get the whole thing so destabilized that you can then move on to the later part of the program. And part two was, having destabilized the whole structure of the West, then we swing into place a new type of centralism and this will be a world order program. And Lenin said we have to get the world to the point where all nations are directed by one central plan. That is how we're going to deliver in the final Soviet system. Now this, this, was, this was very, very important stuff. This was not some right-wing conservative out in the West talking. This was right from the horse's mouth. It was their own evaluation. It was just after this came out that we had the top Soviet in the United Nations the Under Secretary of State for Legal and Constitutional Affairs in the United Nations, by the name of Arkady Shevchenko, defected across to the Western world. And he said, you might as well face it, he said the United Nations is the biggest control mechanism and the biggest spy tower that the Soviet Union has anywhere else in the world. Nobody really wanted to listen to that. The only paper in Australia that really carried his story was the Australian. London Daily Telegraph did a lot of work on Arkady Shevchenko, who's just drifted down into complete obscurity. So this was big stuff, and uh, I began to look deeper and deeper into the whole question. Now it just happened that before that had taken place, the Australian government started putting advertisements in the paper, asking for submissions to a Senate committee, the Senate Committee on Foreign Affairs and Defence, I think it was, on the implications for Australia of the new international economic order. So I collected all the stuff that I possibly could, put it into a submission, which was later reprinted as a booklet, and we're hoping to reprint it fairly soon again, and sent it in. I never even got an acknowledgement from the government that it had gone in. They finally produced their own summary, which is that, the new international economic order implications for Australia report from the Senate Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs and Defense. That came out in 1980. And I might tell you that it, although it's very, very non-committal, it does point some of the problems that we've got at the present time. Now, even more absurd was that while that Senate Committee was sitting and taking that evidence, you could still find a lot of backbench members of Parliament who'd never heard of the new international economic order. And I had a, quite a confrontation in South Australia with a liberal backbencher who just said, look, the whole idea of a new international economic order is a figment in the mind of Jeremy Lee. This came out in the papers. Even though the Senate committee was taking evidence on the wretched thing at the very time he was writing. And I thought, probably the only people who don't know what's going on in the world at the present time are members of parliament, it seems to me. Now, what connection has that got with the crisis economically that we're going through? And the answer is it's got everything to do with it. Because my own personal belief is that this crisis has been deliberately engineered for the purpose of delivering in this new international economic order. Can I try and illustrate this? Now I've got to deal with just two parts, our farming industry and our manufacturing industry. Back in 1968, 67, 68, if you were on the land, you might remember we had a huge drought that racked the whole of the eastern states. It was one of the severest droughts we've ever had. I, I remember it because my father had just bought a little wall property down in New England, in New South Wales, and walked straight into that drought, and it wiped out a tremendous number of people. And there were protest meetings seeking desperately some sort of help. We had nearly 300,000 farmers in Australia at that time. And that was then followed as we moved into the 70s by the collapse of the wool industry. Nothing like now, but it was horrific. The price of wool had plummeted down. The ABC was running programs on the fact that wool was now outdated and everybody would be wearing silk in a few years. And by that time, there were real big protests. We were still under the control of the Liberal Country Party, as it used to be called. Bob Menzies had retired. We'd had Harold Holt had tragically drowned, and then we had a succession of rather dismal liberal prime ministers. We had John Gorton, that a lot of people remember. He was a bit like a cowboy, very exciting, but he hadn't got much substance. And then we had a funny little fellow called Billy McMahon. And by that time, everybody was very disillusioned by what was going on, and there was an exciting fellow 
who was now leading a revamped Labour Party called Gough Whitlam, why not give him a go? And just before Gough Gough Whitlam came in, we had this document produced by the Labour Party, which was Labour's Federal Rural Policies. And the man who put this together was a brilliant man by the name of Rex Patterson, who was a Queenslander, a Fulbright scholar. He was no slouch. And he was dealing with this horrendous crisis in the bush. And can I just read you what he said? There's ample proof to show that high interest rates are imposing severe burdens on export rural industries just as they are on other sections of the community such as young homeowners. A Labour government would investigate the overall application of interest rates as they affect primary production and productivity generally with the objective of providing low and reasonable interest rates to those soundly based industries on which the economic health of the nation greatly depends. So this is what they were going to do. Labour's debt alleviation policies would take the form of making available long-term, low-interest loans to pay off immediately the crippling high-interest short-term loans which many producers have been forced to accept from financial institutions and higher purchase companies. And he had every reason to write that because interest rates were creeping up and threatened to hit 8%. And then came the magic bit. At the same time, a Labour government will allow a holiday period of up to five years for potentially viable producers as regard the repayment of principal and interest in order to allow farmers to strengthen their financial position. We're going to give farmers five years not having to pay the bank any interest or any repayments at all. And I might tell you that was only the rural policy. The same line of thinking was coming right through the whole of Labour's policy. Now, it immediately raises huge questions. How on earth would they finance that? Would we go and borrow more money overseas and tack it on the end of the foreign debt, or how was it going to be done? And there was no mucking about. They were quite specific, and this is what they said. Labour's long-term development policies and reconstruction policies will be financed through the Commonwealth Bank under the best possible terms and conditions which the nation can afford. And then comes a hard-hitting statement. Labour is not tied, nor has it any allegiance to the private banking sector and higher purchase institutions. Labour believes that a lowering of the rate of interest for funds used for the efficient production of commodities, particularly for the earning of export income, will assist increased productivity. This, in turn, is necessary to counter the forces of inflation associated with full employment and growth. Did you pick up that last sentence? We need to lower interest rates to counter inflation. Now they're using the opposite argument, we've got to raise interest rates to to cover inflation. You see? You can make black look white if you're a politician. But you see, the other thing is, the best terms and conditions the nation could afford, we've got some precedents. The Commonwealth Bank financed Australia during the First World War at half a percent interest rate. It was used to save the wool industry during the Second World War. I don't know whether you know it. We've got an absolute panic now because we've got five million bales of wool in stock that we can't sell and the whole thing's collapsed. We had ten million at the end of the war and it was no problem at all because we had the finance to handle it and the whole lot had gone within three years and then we had a wool boom. Now that's what Labour was going to do. And the man who put that together, Rex Patterson, was waiting for Gough Whitlam's electoral victory to do it. And Gough Whitlam was swept in with a huge majority and Rex Patterson found he never even got his nose in the ministry. He was shunted off to the back bench and into his spot came a giant of a man called Al Grasby who became the Minister for Primary Industry. And at that moment, the whole program changed. The first steps towards internationalizing Australia had begun. Gough Whitlam delivered Australia in that direction. He delivered speech after speech on the new international economic order and bringing in world order things. We had a a lawyer by the name of Lionel Murphy who tried to bring in the first Human Rights Commission and failed because they hadn't got the numbers in the Senate. And you want to go and read what the Liberal and the Country Party were saying against Lionel Murphy when that bill was put through, how disgusting it was, and it would sabotage Australia's 
constitution and goodness knows what. And no sooner did the Liberals get in when Gough Whitlam got out than they put through what Lionel Murphy couldn't get through himself. There was no change, no change whatsoever. So we were then headed straight into the New World Order program and it was going to decimate primary industry and small business. Now we were a pretty self-sufficient nation at that time. Hundreds and hundreds of little industries had gained maximum protection at the end of the war and were really going for their lives. You could go into the hardware shops and you could go into our grocery shops and light engineering and you'd find nearly all the stuff you bought was made in Australia, but that's not the case today. You go into your spare parts or you go into your supermarket and you'll find made where? South Korea or North Korea or Taiwan or Sri Lanka or Zimbabwe or Brazil or the Argentine and hundreds and hundreds of little industries tremendous industries that used to be the basis of Australia's productive sector have gone to the war. Half our industries lost since 1971. Half our industries. And they are now falling quicker than they've ever fallen during that last 21 period. 20, 21 year period. And the result of this is that you find more and more workers in Australia suddenly getting out of their employment onto the dole queue. Why then aren't there union leaders saying, well look, why now are we sacrificing Australian industries so that workers lose their jobs? We're going to fight the government and they should have got alongside small business to fight the program, instead of which they were all participating. So you can see how the thing has gotten. We've now reached the point where all of a sudden we're finding that the farmers have caught up with small business. We've reached the point now that in one of the great wool of food producing nations of the world were importing each year two thousand million dollars worth of food into Australia and the picture is quite frightening we're importing big quantities of meat millions of dollars we're importing nearly five hundred million dollars worth of vegetables into Australia and if you want to see how absurd that is just get in your car over a weekend and drive from here to Toowoomba through that Lockyer Valley which is one of the greatest vegetable growing areas in Australia and you will find farmers out there plowing their vegetables in because they can't get them to the market. That is absolutely true. We're importing something like 33 million dollars worth of tomato paste into Australia. How the heck you do that I cannot think. We're importing lamb meat, we're importing leather, we're importing, you just name it and you'll find we're now importing sixteen thousand dollars worth of food into Australia for every farmer that we've got left. And that figure is going to rise dramatically because at the moment we're losing one farmer every hour of every day, 24 hours a day. Huge exodus. We're going to lose half of them before too long. And round the farmers, we're going to lose hundreds and hundreds more of what is left of our business structure. Now, how did we reach that point? Because just before Gough Whitlam got tossed out, he signed, I believe, the most infamous document of the whole lot, which is the document that sabotaged our industries. It was called the Lima Declaration. And the Lima Declaration came from a division of the United Nations called UNIDO, the United Nations Industrial and Development Organization. It was signed, strangely enough, in Lima in Peru. And basically it said this, the third world is collapsing under debt and the reason it is collapsing is because the big industrial nations of the West have been too fat and greedy and have got too big a slice of the cake. Therefore, we're going to ask those industrial nations to sign an agreement that they will wind down their own industries and transfer technology across into third world countries so that they can begin to produce what nations like Australia used to produce themselves and then we'll give them preferred nation status in exporting back inside those countries. Now can you believe that an Australian government would sign a document which says we wind our own industries down and give another nation the chance to send, sell us back the stuff that we used to produce ourselves? But we signed that. Whitlam signed it and the man who pushed it harder and further than anybody else was a guy called Malcolm Fraser who was making speeches all around the world on the need for the common fund. And if you want to see it, in documented form, there is the United Nations 
Conference on Trade and Development. This, by this time it was under ANCTAD. An International Code of Condu Conduct on Transfer of Technology. The whole story is in there. Officially documented book. So we've wrecked our industries and we're wrecking them even faster. And as a result of this, taxes have gone up, debt has gone up, and interest rates, well perhaps you haven't noticed it up here, but interest rates have gone up too. And you can find farmers out in the bush paying up to 27% interest. Every time they get into trouble and move into a new risk factor, the interest rate goes up instead of down to try and keep them on their feet. And the result is there's absolute chaos now in rural Australia, and we're going to see that hitting the cities with increasing violence over the next 6 to 8 to 12 months. Hundreds and hundreds of industries will go and jobs will disappear. Not because we can't produce, not because Australians are bludgers and can't compete with Southeast Asia, which is the story being spun at us the whole time, but simply because we have been deliberately put under penalties which make it impossible to survive however good you are. And then accused of being inefficient when you can't keep up. And that's how the game is played. And ultimately, at some point, they will say, well, the only way to solve that is to try and bring in this new world order. Now, how does that then tie in with the Gulf War? When we sent our mighty armed forces over to prop up George Bush in the Middle East, it produced two problems for Mr. Hawke. The first was that the peace movement got its act together and we began to see peace pro protests, which became quite big. The second thing was, much more serious for him, it split the Labour Party. And there was a big section in the Labour Party did not like the idea of simply wagging its tail every time the Americans whistled. And finally, at the very time he needed national unity to try and um, preserve some sort of impact overseas, Bob Hawke called together the Labour Party. The argument he used was not, we've got to beat Saddam Hussein, or we've got to defend oil, or this is, a, this is a mighty blow for the little man, or anything like that. He simply said, do you not realize that this is part of the world order program? That's why we've all got to stick together. And the Labour left basically said, oh, we didn't realize that. All right, well, then we'll back off. And finally, it came out in a full page in The Australian, why Labour would go to war for the New World Order. That was the headline at the top. Why Labour would go to war for the New World Order. And it had the whole argument. I'd just like to read you the um, arguments of just one backbench Labour man, Dr. Andrew Theophanis. This is what he said in the House of Representatives. A new world order is emerging as is shown by the unprecedented resolution 678 of the United Nations Security Council. When a situation arises in which the United Nations has gained a tremendous boost in its power, in its authority, and is able to carry resolutions and concrete actions as a result of those resolutions, then people who describe themselves as leftist or socialist should not be concerned about it but should welcome such developments because the increase in the powers of the United Nations is a very significant development. It is something which the ALP has been committed to for many, many years, ever since the time of Dr. Everett. And those of you that know anything about Dr. Everett would know that he set the whole thing in motion through the Fabian Society and was in actual fact the first president of the United Nations. So that's the argument that Bob Hawke used. Now what did Dr. Andrew Theophilus mean when he said this is part of our program? You've got to go and have a look at this document, which is the Australian Labour Party 1982 Platform and Rules, which came in just before Bob Hawke got into power. It was no longer the old traditional Labour Party of Ben Shifley and John Curtin and Arthur Corwell and some of the great Labour men of the past who, whatever else you say, were certainly patriotic Australians. This was a totally revamped, changed Labour Party that was now involved in a world program. And so it started off virtually on page one with the things that had to be done for the new world order. The flag must be changed. We've got to get rid of the monarchy and have a republic. It's written in there. 
We've got to eliminate barriers against world law, such as the Senate and the Constitution. And then you swing from there and it goes straight onto it. We are now totally committed to the new world order. As part of the program of the Socialist International, with which we are affiliated. And people say the Socialist International never heard of it. Well, you should have done because it's just had its world conference down in Sydney. What, two weeks ago? Now, we're not talking about a little fly-by-night organization. We're talking about a huge movement that was started in 1864 by a gentleman called Karl Marx. He formed the first Socialist International. It fell to pieces for a short while when communism reached its heights under Lenin, but was then revamped in 1951 in a big conference in Hamburg in Germany, and now has its headquarters in London. It sends documents right throughout the world. It co coordinates labor and socialist parties. It writes their agendas in many cases. You can go and read what the Labor Party in New Zealand says, and the Labor Party here says it comes from the same pen quite often. And they are working on a common program towards a world order. The current chairman of the Socialist International is Willy Brandt. Former Chancellor of West Germany got sacked from office for hiding the fact that one of his top staff members was a KGB agent who had been giving NATO secrets to Moscow. And went straight from there to the Socialist International where he's been ever since. He was featured in The Australian, speaking on behalf of the Socialist International at their big conference in Sydney. I might just tell you, the Socialist International was scheduled to have its Australian conference in 1983, but that was the year that Bob Hawke was standing for election, so it was postponed. This came out in the media. We've postponed it because it could be a bit embarrassing having the Socialist International meeting at the time when Bob Hawke's trying to get his nose in the trough. Well, they didn't say that. Trying to get into office. <laughs> 1978, the Socialist International held its conference in Vancouver, in Canada. Willie Brandt was asked to push the world government program. Would you set up an international commission to produce a document, the blueprint for world government? Which he did, and there it is. North-South, Program for Survival, the Brandt Commission Report. Headed by Willie Brandt, 23 people on his committee, top bankers and industrialists and prime ministers and Edward Heath, the former prime minister of Britain, Olaf Palm, the famous socialist from Scandinavia, they're all there. And this is, the, the, if you like, the definitive work on the world government movement. It's got the whole program. The, the World Bank and the money fund and the transfer of technology and the new money system, the whole bit. It's all in there. Uh, Pan Books got the contract to print it. I think a million copies came rolling off the press and every member of parliament throughout the world was sent a copy. Most of them probably threw it in the waste paper basket because they still don't know about it, but there is the Brand Commission report. And that document there... There's another little book. Can't see it. And the one produced in Moscow, both came out in the same year, 1978. That's the Moscow Valuation of the World Order Program. That's the Socialist International, both pushing exactly the same story. World government is the only chance for mankind. That's where we are. That's the program we're going into now. All right, now we're in 1990, 1991. How far are we along the program? Well, every, every paper now is coming out with a story. This has just come out in the last few months. This came out in the Financial Review, which is the main paper telling the story. United States push for creation of new world trade group. That's the whole common fund idea. United States grappling to adjust to the dissolution of its post-war economic supremacy is now resurrecting the idea of an all-powerful supranational institution for world trade. Supranational means above nations, a concept it spurned and buried more than 40 years ago. The idea was originally advocated by John Maynard Keynes at the Bretton Woods conferences. The United States rejected it then because it impinged on United States sovereignty. But now is the time to accept it, you see. Oh, the world negotiable bond issue. This came out in the Financial Review as we moved into 1990. World negotiable bond issue. World Bank has announced plans to launch a $1.5 billion bond issue, which for the first time will be negotiable in all the world's main capital markets. The issue will be tradable in the European, United States, and Japanese capital markets. The World Bank 
is the largest regular user of the international capital markets and its planned global issue will blend issuing techniques in the euro bond and the US markets. They've had two issues since that article came out. They were both snapped up. But you see, the argument is not new. It's written as though this is a brilliant new idea they've just thought of. You can go right back to this, towards a world central bank. This was a paper given by McCheney Martin at the Pierre Jacobson letter. He was the first president, uh, secretary, I think, of the International Monetary Fund. This was, I think, 1980. And he just bluntly says, we are going to issue and create out of nothing. He actually says this, the new world money system. We will have to have control. Yes, it is true that it impinges on the sovereignty of all nations, but that's the price they've got to pay for order. The whole thing's set out there. Pierre Paul Schweitzer, a little earlier on, 1967, issued a statement in which he said, we're simply going to create out of nothing the new money that the world is going to need. Now, if they can do that through the International Monetary Fund, why can't we do it here in Australia for our own needs? And the answer is we can, and we have in the past, but we've now agreed implicitly that we won't do that because it might jeopardize the push towards world order. We've got a, a bunch in power who are now taking Australia in that direction and they don't want anything that would slow up the movement towards world government. Or take another issue. You've recently seen advertisements in the press, you might have experienced it, where if you go along to your local bank now, you're supposed to produce ID cards and tax file numbers, even though you, whatever it is, even though you know the local bank manager perhaps and You've been in there for the last 20 years and you've played bowls with them on Saturday afternoon and babysit his kids and all the rest of it. That's not good enough. How does he know that you are you? So, you've now got to produce all this ID, but where did it come from? It came from Interpol, the international police organization based in Paris. This stuff came out from Congressman Ron Paul, one of the most brilliant and knowledgeable commentators in America, talking about Interpol. During the past 20 years, Interpol has mainly been used to track terrorists, art theft, international murder plots, and Nazis. But in 1984, things began to change. <clears throat> John Simpson, then director of the United States Secret Service, was appointed as the president of Interpol. One year later, Raymond Kendall from Britain was appointed to oversee the daily operations of Interpol. In late 1985, top police from 140 countries met in Washington, D.C. for eight days for Interpol's first meeting in the United States in 25 years. President Reagan and Attorney General Edwin Meese addressed the crowd. The proceedings were not, of course, open to the public or the press. Since Interpol's activities are no longer confined to real criminals, with, quote, financial criminals and money launderers prime targets, and since the Fed Federal Reserve defines financial crimes and money laundering as not filling out the right form at the bank when withdrawing our own honestly earned money, we should be concerned. Here are the goals of this new pact. One, industrial countries will adopt the strict reporting requirements of the Baal Committee, which is an international banking group. Two, the countries will then adopt the same laws and regulations concerning movements of cash around the world. Three, all banks, bankers associations and police within the trilateral countries will share information with every other bank enforcement agency. Four, regulators, bankers associations and law enforcement agencies will merge their enforcement techniques. Five, Interpol Act facilities will be used as the central clearinghouse to provide information on, quote, problem individuals or businesses within this network to facilitate their prosecution. And Paul's conclusion was, this means that your local banker will become a spy for this arrangement, exchanging information on you with every other country using the International Criminal Police Organization, which could include China and possibly the Soviet Union next year. There you are, that's what's behind that one. Simple as that. Now, before the world is finally shunted or pulled or pushed or bullied or persuaded or uh, seduced into this new world order, We're being regionalized into three major trading blocks. First of which is Britain, uh, is Europe, which comes into fruition on the 31st of December, six days after Christmas, 1992. Everything is now 1992. Now, I don't know whether you realize it, but on that night, the Union Jack is pulled down in Britain and a new flag goes up. If you find that hard to believe, 
Here is a special supplement produced by the Sunday Times in Britain that gives the whole story. Sunday Times magazine, you are a European, here is your official flag, this is how to draw it, 1992, are you ready? And there is a picture of the new flag that will fly over the whole of this centralized Europe. It's a navy blue flag with a gold circle of... It looks rather like the United Nations flag, doesn't it? Curiously like the United Nations flag. We had one of the most eminent lawyers in Britain, Lord Denning, former master of the rolls, got up and said it's the end of our sovereignty, it's the end of our courts, it's the end of common law, it's the end of at least 1,500 years of our Westminster system. We will simply be a cipher taking orders from a centralized parliament in Brussels, and that's what it's all about. 1992. Now, the person who signed on behalf of Britain to go into that was Margaret Thatcher, who subsequently woke up to what had happened and began to dig her heels in as she realized the full ramifications of the single European Act. She said, we agree to cooperate, but not to lose our sovereignty. We certainly won't accept a central European bank of what is called EMU, the European Monetary System. And no sooner did she say that than the attack began. The whole media began to tear her to pieces, which is virtually controlled by two men in Britain, Rupert Murdoch and a gentleman called Mr. Robert Maxwell, which is his current name. His previous name was Mr. Koch. And ultimately, it led to the end of Margaret Thatcher as the Prime Minister. The man to take Britain into Europe was waiting in the wings, ready to take over Mr. Michael Heseltine, who just missed out by a fluke. And a little unknown guy called John Major became the Prime Minister, who was a Thatcher follower, and is trying to play it by ear a little bit slower. He can't just stand in the light or he'll get knocked over, but at least he's trying to drag his feet. But Margaret Thatcher, interestingly, has now become the chairman of a group called the Bruges Group, which is a new association of politicians opposed to going into Europe, which is growing slowly the whole time. And they come from every party, Labour, Social Democrat, and also Conservatives. And they're getting more and more publicity. They can't knock her off the perch now because she's already done and she's probably going to do more good there than as the Prime Minister. Rather interesting. And the opinion polls in Britain show a great hardening towards this idea. So much could happen between now and 1992. But, but, just after she signed the Single European Act, onto the world stage bounced a new figure by the name of Mikhail Gorbachev. He just came right out of the blue. Nobody had really ever heard of him. But he said a very interesting thing. Yes, I am a convinced Marxist-Leninist. Always have been, and I still am. But I'm a different one. I'm a nice one. <laughs> Why? Because he wanted to bring the Soviet into this new world setup. And you can't do that while there's an Iron Curtain and a Berlin Wall. So he had to create the atmosphere in which the change was occurring. And he was faded through the world. The man who's bringing glasnost and perestroika went to America, got a ticker tape welcome. They had Razor Gorbachev written up in every ladies' magazine. All the little sort of finicky things that housewives pick up. You know, where she was buying her underwear and what fur coat she was wearing and what lipstick she wore and how many grandchildren. It was all just human interest stuff, but did they get sucked in? And he ended up getting the Nobel Peace Prize. The man who's driving the tanks through Latvia and Lithuania at the present time, the Nobel Peace Prize. You see, he made one mistake. All that stuff was for the West to believe, not his own people. And they began to take it seriously. And they said, thank you very much. Yes, we'll have some dissent now. Yes, we'd like, uh, we'd like a decentralization of power. Yes, we would like our own government back. Well, they weren't supposed to do that. <laughs> And now he's finding that he's got the tiger by the tail and he doesn't know how to let go. He's going to be consumed by the very thing that he thought he was shaping. The second block, North America. North American block is being rushed through at the present time. Now this has only come out in the, just the last few weeks. This was the headline, the leading article in the Financial Review, February the 7th. There we are. North America builds own trade block. 
the merging of Canada, the United States, and Mexico to begin with, then to be followed by countries in Latin America and the Caribbean, and it is not just a common market. It is political. They've got to have common legislation, all the ingredients that are being shaped in Europe, free movement, free travel, different passports. And then there's a third block, which is the Pacific Rim block. And the architect for that is a gentleman called Robert James Lee Hawke, pushing that as hard as he can. And I want to tell you, it is a central political idea. The, the book, The Pacific Parliament, has already been written. Written by Mike Moore, the former, former Prime Minister of, Britain, of New Zealand, for a short while before he got hoofed out. He took over from Longy. He has written the definitive work, the, Europe, the Pacific Parliament, it's called. And the idea is that you have a block now moving from the Soviet Union itself, that's the western part, right through China, including the two Koreas, including Taiwan, which is, of course, not supposed to be there at all, it's simply part of China. The whole of Indonesia, which we forget, is the biggest Mohammedan country in the world, bigger than anything in the Middle East. Bring in the Philippines, bring in New Guinea, bring in Vietnam and Laos and Cambodia, and tacked right onto the bottom of that is a little, well it's not a little, it's a big island continent inhabited by the sleepiest, dopiest, most materialistic, self-centered people in the world today. But the only thing that ever moves them is footy or tinnies or arguments about whether powers is better than forex or the Melbourne Cup. And we are going to get hit so hard. We're just getting the first blow now. We ain't seen nothing. You know, we think that things are getting tough. Boy, what those people in behind the Iron Curtain have gone through. I remember many of them, you know, Ukrainians and Latvians, they come up to you at meetings and they say, why can't the Australian people see what's happening? Do you know that we are training young people through our educational system that don't even know their own history? We've got 75% of young people in this country who've never even heard of the Constitution. How do they know what they can defend? They know all about everybody else's dream time, from the Eskimos to... The Sioux of, 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 of North America or something, but talk about their own history and, and their own heritage. And that's where we are at the present time. Sometime, I don't know when, I'm certainly no prophet and I don't want to start trying to prophesy, but I would imagine between now and the end of the century, we are going to be brought to a point of no return. We haven't reached it yet. Which way does Australia go? Because you see, there's one vital question we've got to answer. If we go into this world government, even piecemeal, what happens to our constitution? Which is the founding document that put this country together. We all voted the thing in by a referendum in this country. The decisions made in Australia are made by the Australian people, not by the United Nations or anybody else. Yes, we want to cooperate with other nations, but we don't want to lose our sovereignty, surely. We the people, it says. And then that phrase, humbly relying on the blessing of Almighty God, which wasn't even in that constitution originally, until a huge campaign said, let's put those words in. That's where truth and freedom comes from. And then it sets out the rules. This is the parliament. This is the upper house. That's the lower house. That's how the judges are appointed. This is how we have elections. These are when the elections will be. These are the powers the government shall have. No more, no less. And you go right to the end and it says, not one word of the rules for Australia shall be changed unless we've had a referendum. And all the people have been asked and they know what the decision is and they can say yes or no. Do you think Bob Hawke or John Hewson or whoever comes after him is going to have a referendum of the people and say, look Australia, we've got this chance to go into world government. And we think probably it's the right one. You know, everybody else is doing it, but we know the rules say, before we do it, we're supposed to ask you. Because we are your servants, and the Constitution says, uh, could we have a referendum now, whether you say yes or no? Do you think they're going to do that? So what we've got to do is work to create 
the mechanism to have a say. If we don't do that, we're gone. And that's why this whole thing on citizens-initiated referendum is so incredibly important. It's much more than whether we bring the price of sardines down. It could be the whole, it could be the one mechanism we need to say yay or nay for the future of this country. And that is this thing that citizens can actually have a referendum when they want. And the government can't go against that if the majority say no. Citizens initiated referendum. The thing that works in Switzerland. Which isn't a member of the United Nations. Their referendum kept Switzerland out of the United Nations. There's streets ahead of us, aren't they? I believe that's the choice we've got, whether we remain a Christian country or whether we opt now for the new religion of world order, which is basically humanistic, very antagonistic to Christianity. And the last point I'd like to make is, who is therefore going to shape our choice? And I've got a horrible message for you. There ain't nobody left but us. Each one of us here tonight. People say, oh, don't talk like that. I'm flat out trying to keep going, you know. My business is up to here in debt and I can't keep up with my job. And, you know, the price of petrol goes up every week. The wife's nagging me. The kids are at my back the whole time. How do you expect, expect me to save the nation? And I, I haven't got a quick answer. Except that if each one of us does something, if we simply keep in touch, if we can get one tape of an address like this around, if we can just get hold of a member of parliament and just say once to him, I'm not voting for you unless you stand up. It does make a difference. Many drops fill the bucket. Therefore, each one of you is tremendously important here tonight. We haven't got the whole of Brisbane. But you know, the world's been changed with a smaller number than we've got here tonight. Each one of you is very, very important. I don't care if you're 95, you can do something. You can stick a, a stamp on an envelope and write to somebody. If you're young, you're incredibly important. This country belongs to you. Never believe anything else. But we better get started, because we haven't got too much time. Thank you very much. <laughs>